Good morning and welcome to the 2021 Oregon Active Transportation Summit. My name is Brad Nelson. My pronouns are he, him, and his, and I'm the owner of Mile Point Events. Before we begin our program, the Street Trust would like to acknowledge the land that we are occupying. The Portland metro area rests on the traditional village sites of the Multnomah, Waskow, Cowlitz, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Bands of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalupraya, Moala, and other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia River. We take this opportunity to thank the original characters of this land. Thank you. Welcome to Comprehensive Micromobility Data from Bike and Scooter Systems. Your presenters for this session are Ann Brown, Joel Miller, Anna Zivartz, and Lee Foley. Your moderator is John MacArthur. ASL interpretation is provided by Stellar Communication. To ensure you can see the ASL, please hover over the interpreter's video and select PIN in the menu under the three blue dots in the right-hand corner. Our interpreters will switch approximately every 15 minutes. You'll want to repin. You can type your questions in the chat or use the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. And please use the social media hashtag Oats21 to post about the summit on social media. And don't forget to include, excuse me, to visit our website at thestreettrust.org to learn more about our other programs and activities, including SB395, aka Safe Routes for All, an update to the historic bike bill on its 50th anniversary that the Street Trust is championing in the Oregon Legislature this session. To claim AICP credit for attending the session, please log on to the OAT Sketch platform and find the certificate download link near the top of the page. Now, without further delay, please welcome to your screen, John MacArthur. Hi, thanks a lot, Brad. Uh, and also thanks uh, Street Trust uh, and the uh, other people that are putting on this, this conference. Uh, I always love uh, OATS and uh, it's, it's good to be virtual. It's it's always better to be in person, but I'll take virtual uh, as we have a great uh, panel here. So uh, welcome. This is the OATS discussion on how shared mobility, micro mobility is transforming and how it can be leveraged to make more sustainable communities. And I'm John MacArthur. I work at uh, Trek at Portland State University. I'm a uh, the Sustainable Transportation Program Manager and, and uh, Research Associate there. I've been doing research and work within this space for uh, over 10 plus years at, at Track, and um, really excited about this, this panel. And so uh, 2019, uh, do people remember 2019? I, I, I mean, gosh. It was a huge year for micromobility. And you know, I don't know if people remember, but we had 136 million trips within the micromobility space. And it was looking to be a huge year in 2020 and then COVID happened. So big, uh, tough year uh, for all of us in many different ways, but for micromobility, we saw, you know, um, consolidation happening. Uh, some companies, uh, you know, uh, not making it, and uh, and then there was, you know, a big reduction of trips of in 2020. But we also saw some interesting things happen. Um, consolidation, uh, trip purposes changing. You know, we saw that bike share and scooter share helping. You know, um, frontline workers and. Uh, um, emergency response, people get to their jobs. Uh, so, you know, we've seen a rebound of trips, you know, uh, since the, the crash in the early 2020. Um, but now we see new companies, uh, we have uh, technology advances happening both in the vehicle space and on the software space. We're seeing some transit integration happening around the, the country. There are a couple really big national safety research projects going on to kind of understand uh, the safety issues around micromobility. And then some of the, uh, I think, really heartening thing that happened in 2020 for me in this space is we saw, you know, this kind of idea of prioritizing um, walking and biking and micromobility spaces, you know, and so both Portland and Seattle and other cities have dedicated streets to walking and biking and um, which is, I think, exciting and, and needed to create safer, better places for us to uh, be active in and, and use these kind of uh, low speed devices. So um, that said, um, you know, we're in 2021, I think companies are looking at how to be profitable, but they're still facing uh, challenges in equity and safety and inclusivity. 
So we're going to talk about that. And uh, so let's go. I think we had some um, poll questions that you all answered. And Brad, I don't know if uh, those, you can pop up the answers or just to see where we are. Oh, there we are. So first question, uh, how long does a, a average scooter last before needing to be replaced? 45% of you said it was between six and one year. Well, what we hear, and we can, you know, see, you know, have a discussion a little bit about this, but uh, a lot of industries, you know, are pushing to, it's definitely more than a year. Uh, and I think there's more advances in improving the devices to make sure they last longer. Uh, what about, uh, about what percentage of scooters are parked improperly, uh, even briefly? 42% uh, say more than 30%. Well, we'll have some insights on that uh, from Ann, uh, but uh, it all depends on what you're talking about. It, and so is it improperly towards a certain code or is it blocking pedestrian way? Uh, but we'll get into that. We'll see uh, what uh, some of the results are for, for that on some studies that we have. And then which is the most important to have in a sustainable city and uh, tied bike share and both. So looking at we need a full range of micro mobility uh, and bike shares a, pr a preference to, to some of you out there. So uh, let's jump into this. And uh, so the way it's going to go, we have this wonderful panel. Um, uh, I'm going to, they're each going to introduce themselves and talk, you know, briefly um, about their top lessons they want to share uh, with, with you. Um, and then, um, and then we're going to have open it up for a panel discussion for a little bit uh, and then allow at the very end, maybe 15 minutes, uh, around 11 o'clock, um, open it up for Q&A. So if you have a question, open up your Q&A tab there and type it in. Uh, and so uh, so I can see it and we'll, uh, we'll try to get to as many of those questions as possible. Um, the, you know, I like the Q&A better than the chat, but if that's where you need to put the question, I'll also be looking at that too. Um, so let's jump in and um, we're gonna have, uh, we have, you know, Ann Brown, uh, Anna Zverts, Joe Miller, and Lee Foley. And Anne, why don't you go first? Thanks, John, and good to be with everyone. Um, happy you're here with us this morning. I'm Ann Brown. I'm an assistant professor in planning public policy and management at the University of Oregon. I research transportation equity, shared mobility, and travel behavior. Um, so this is, uh, I'm happy to be with you all. I'm excited for questions and discussion later. Um, my main, I think there's a lot of lessons we can take from micro mobility. Um, the main one I have right now is that micro mobility offers tremendous potential for our cities to meet a lot of uh, various goals, but that those goals aren't just going to be realized by default. They take intentional planning, thinking about how micro, micro mobility can align with those goals and coordinate that with uh, program design data and then evaluation and iteration to actually fully realize those goals. Great, uh, Anna. Yes, hi, Anna Zimards here, uh, Disability Rights Washington, Disability Mobility Initiative. And I think, you know, what's exciting to me about micro mobility as someone who's low vision, uh, who can't drive is that we start to talk about all the different ways we move and all the different ways that, that we can use assistive devices and, and to sort of take away some of the stigma around using uh, mobility devices and creating the infrastructure that we need to actually have those be uh, incorporated into our street fabric, uh, making sure that we have parking places for them that aren't blocking the right of way for pedestrians, making sure we have curb ramps, making sure we have smooth roads, making sure we have lighting and all those things will make our cities more accessible uh, and more equitable for all of us if if we can um, view micromobility through a through a broader lens and think about the needs of people, not just uh, able-bodied folks who could benefit from from using micromobility, but how to make this and how to ensure and center the needs of folks who aren't uh, who aren't um, able-bodied, who are 
older, who are have kids, who have groceries, who have other things they need to carry. How can we start to center those needs and those designs in um, in the work we do with micro mobility? Great, thanks. Well, we're going to jump to the third coast and Lee, Chicago. All right, thank you for that. Uh, good afternoon from the third coast and good morning to everyone in the Pacific Northwest. I am uh, very glad to be uh, joining you all uh, as a representative of Lime, the world's largest uh, and most experienced uh, shared electric vehicle company. Uh, and uh, just to give you a brief introduction about myself, uh, again, my name is Lee Foley, and I'm the Director of Government and Community Relations for Lime, uh, based in Chicago, uh, and primarily focusing on the Midwest. Uh, but I'm glad to be able to speak to you all about uh, equity, I'm going to about different ways that Lime has innovated in this space to be a global leader. I'm in addressing parking issues, equity, and, ac and accessibility issues. Um, I've spent about a decade in the space of building uh, partnerships with different local governments, uh, having worked with uh, Amazon, managing their local government relations, uh, and, and of particular interest for the Pacific Northwest is advocating for the protection of national parks with the uh, National Parks Conservation Association. I've been with Lyme for the last year, lending my expertise in building these relationships with local governments. Um, and I can't wait to uh, dive in and speak a little bit more deeply about how we can continue to build successful partnerships with cities. Thank you. Great, thanks Lee. And then Joel. Yeah, hi everybody, I'm Joel Miller. I am the <clears throat> shared micromobility lead at the Seattle Department of Transportation. I've uh, been working in this space since the very early days, way back in ancient history of 2017, when um, Seattle first piloted dockless bike share um, with uh, these weird bikes that you had to pedal and there was no electric assist. Um, and uh, yeah, my one of my, my lessons is actually something that we're just um, really pushing now, and that's in... Um, when you, when you talk about equity, when you talk about um, shared micromobility really working for low-income people and people of color, um, the outreach that we've done so far, really the first big lesson we're learning is just um, people don't know about it. You know, we know we know our Amazon workers in Seattle and our tech workers, they readily embrace shared micromobility. But to make it a truly equitable program that, that works for people across the city, um, you really need to re invest resources in, in making sure that people know, making sure that low income people know, making sure that black and brown people know about these options, about our low income options that makes it almost free to, to take a ride. And so um, as, as we lean on vendors to do it, I would just encourage cities to also dedicate a lot of resources to doing this yourself so that, that you're really controlling that outreach process. Great. And Joe, so what's start with you since you're you're on the line here um uh the city of, uh, of seattle's you know struggled uh with you know getting public bike share up and going has lost you know funding you know recently or in the past um the city has taken a unique approach to securing bike share for the future what is it and how is it working and is this a model that you think could be adopted for other cities yeah, yeah. I mean, Seattle, we, we've lost funding for bike share a few times. Um, back in, in 2017, we had a traditional dock based bike share system called Pronto that, uh, that we lost funding for and that failed. And that was kind of what opened up the doors for Seattle to pilot dockless bike share um, just a, a few months later. Um, and then as, uh, as the dockless bike share market kind of morphed and the venture capital moved to the dockless scooter share market, um, you know, we saw very, very quickly a lot less investment in, in dockless bike share. And so, um, you know, we saw that, hey, if we want to keep this great thing, this, this great mobility option for folks in Seattle, we need to pivot as well. And um, the way we did that was by looking to scooters to saying, okay, how can we use um, where the investment is now, dockless scooter share, to make sure that, that um, we're keeping bike share in Seattle. So we, we essentially designed a whole um, permit for a company that um, promised to keep bikes in Seattle, and that was Lime, um, to also operate scooters. And, and I think that's been successful for us. I think we're, we're starting to now see other cities, but also other scooter companies kind of pivot back to being, hey, we're, we're not just offering these stand style scooters. We're going to offer sit style. We're going to offer 
bikes and we're gonna we're gonna kind of embrace micro mobility as a whole concept rather than, than one specific vehicle and i think really the lesson for a lot of cities is um you, know, you can do it a couple ways you can invest a lot of money and if you have that great and that's probably the best long-term approach to be honest but if you don't have it um you need to to kind of stay um pivot with the market as this is going to continue to evolve over the coming months and years um, I'm, I'm sure this isn't our last pivot that we're going to do to, to to keep these options for for folks in seattle great so lee you know you know speaking from lime you know you you're in seattle you offer this suite of micro mobilities and i know that you can are kind of uh even launching other vehicle types within that the, that suite of micro mobility. Um, what are the major learnings that Lime has, you know, by offering not just one type of vehicle? Yeah, thank you for that, John. Uh, what we've seen in Seattle um, and across other cities where we have where we all offer uh, multimodal um, options for people uh, is that we see that people who use bikes and scooters are far more likely to continue using bikes and scooters as a paired offering. Uh, than if they were using, say, if the city just offered bikes or if the city just offered stand-up scooters. And so we really focus on uh, providing multimodal options for people uh, so that they're able to, to figure out the best way to uh, create their trip, to plan their trip uh, around uh, bikes and scooters and other uh, shared mobility modes as opposed to uh, having to use cars or, or their own personal vehicles or ride share um, as a way to be able to get around cities. And so what we're seeing is that when cities offer multimodal options, uh, people tend to take those options. So for example, uh, we look at um, from our research, 27% of people are likely to just use bikes. 43% of, of our riders are likely to just use scooters. But when you combine the two, you see 30% be far more consistent in their uses of the devices over and over and over again. And our goal is to make sure that sh uh, shared mobility, particularly bikes and scooters, and now what Lime has introduced uh, across the world now is mopeds, uh, introducing these different modes and making sure that they become a daily routine, a part of people's daily routines, as they change their behaviors away from cars and figure out the best ways to be able to, uh, to close the gap when they're traveling under five miles, which is the bulk of all miles traveled or all car trips is under five miles. And so we see that multimodal options are definitely uh, the wave of the future and Lime is, uh, is glad to be an innovator in that space. And one thing I'm proud to really share with this panel uh, this afternoon is uh, Lime was uh, named uh, one of the top 100 influential companies in the world um, and as a leader within the micro mobility space, because we focus on multimodal, we're not just a scooter company, we're not just a bike company, and we're not just a moped company. We're a company that's focused on uh, shared mobility for all trips under five miles. Great, thanks. So Anna, uh, you're up in Seattle. How do you see these uh, vehicles benefiting the city? But, and also what are the challenges? Um, sure, yeah, I think, you know, here in Seattle, um, there's been, since I, I, I moved here from New York, and so I came, uh, you know, from a dock system to a dockless system. And when I first got here, I heard a lot of rumblings from other folks in the disability community about it was bike share at that point and the parking issue in particular. And I think that's something we really need to talk about because what happens by default anytime, you know, there's construction, anytime we have these uh, bikes, anytime we have A-frame, you know, signs, advertising, they end up blocking the sidewalk. And for pedestrians, and in particular for disabled folks who don't have access to cars, the sidewalks are our highways, right? They're how we get around. And if that way is blocked and you have to detour or you have to do things that feel unsafe to get, you have to go out into the street to get around something, that's really not where we should <laughs> be taking mobility away from, from people. And so, uh, it was exciting to work with Joel and other folks at the city of Seattle to think about, okay, how can we create parking space, storage space that's not on the sidewalk for these devices? And I think that was a really important partnership, um, working to you know, make sure that the city installed these uh, bike and scooter parking corrals uh, that not only keep the scooters off the sidewalks and the bikes off the sidewalks, they also can daylight intersections and ultimately uh, make our city you know, safer by creating opportunities for people to move out of cars. Because you know, at the end of the day, it's cars that are most likely to cause serious injury to folks, and also all the other you know negative externalities of driving with our climate, with air pollution, 
Um, and so, you know, that that is really positive. Great. Well, I know Anne has done some work uh, looking at um, approaches solving these challenges or even what what challenges are within that space. Uh, Anne, what, what's your thoughts on is this solvable? Uh, I think I'm going to flip the question on its head, actually, John, and say, is there really that big of a problem to solve? Um, which, you know, going back to the poll at the beginning, um, you know, about, let's see, 65 percent of you, about two thirds of you said that uh, you know, more than 20 percent of scooters are, are misparked. And that's really the common perception. We've been, I've been doing research asking the broader public about what do you think? How many scooters, what share of scooters do you think are misparked? And that really is the most common answer. When we've done uh, research in the field, we've actually gone out and looked at scooters and said, okay, are you misparked? And I think it's important for us to say, what do we mean by misparked, right? There's a million minutia of scooter parking code when you really dig into the regulations and statutes. I mean, it's, and it varies by city, it is somewhat mind boggling, the, um, the detail at which the parking regulations for scooters are, are really enumerated. But I think what people really care about is are they blocking access to Anna's point, right? Are they impeding people's ability to travel and move freely? Um, and so when we look at just that question is are scooters blocking access? We collected data from over about five US cities and found that under 2% of scooters were actually blocking pedestrian access. And so I think it's important to just keep the, the bigger picture um, in mind, which is scooters are one piece of equipment on the sidewalks. But to Anna's point, there's a lot of other things. So we actually looked at our, um, our the sandwich boards, those A-frame boards blocking access. It was about the same uh, share of those as scooters. And cars, by contrast, about 25% of those were misparked. They're parking in bike lanes, they're parking in loading zones, which are really important for people to be able to travel freely through our rights of way. And, you know, when we ask people, we ask scooter riders, well, when you miss park, why? And a lot of them said, we don't know the rules. And so it's not necessary. People weren't saying, there could be some bias here. People don't want to say, yeah, I don't care. Um, I'm just going to throw my scooter. But most people were saying, yeah, I, don't, I just don't know um, what the rules are. And we also observe when you provide the infrastructure for people to park their scooters, um, like a corral, um, a designated space, people do park them in those. So we observe really high shares of scooters in designated spaces uh, when they were provided. So I think it's important to think about the broader context and again, zoom back out to what is our goal with managing our rights of way and thinking of scooters as one piece because we don't want scooters to block access and block rights of way. But we also need to manage our space in a more holistic way and look at all modes and all the different things that are on our, our sidewalks and streets. Great, thanks, Sam. So, you know, on that point, Lee, I know Chicago has adopted a locked to approach, you know, so, you know, a device needs to be locked to something uh, that is specified by the, the city. Um, what are the learnings there? Um, and how is Chicago moving this, this pilot forward? Um, and what can we learn from it, you know, being in here in the West Coast? Yeah, so currently, just to, to, to zoom out a little bit, there are currently three cities that require Lock 2. And uh, as John mentioned, Lock 2 is the policy requirement uh, where there are typically Bluetooth uh, locks that are physically connected to the scooter. Um, and then this, the lock is enabled or uh, unlocked um, by a user as they're unlocking the device. Uh, these devices can be locked to bike racks and some cities can be locked to other street furnishings. Uh, and so currently there are three cities uh, that, current, that have Lock 2 as a requirement, that's Chicago, Minneapolis, and St. Paul, and I hear Portland is moving in that direction as well. Um, and what we've seen in Chicago, Chicago has the largest Lock 2 uh, requirement because of the, the, the sort of mass of its program. Uh, the Chicago program has about 10,000 scooters divided evenly amongst three operators, so 33-33 uh, scooters uh, between each company, uh, which means the city made this program citywide. And so now, as opposed to just having this 50 square mile area where the, the pilot program was first piloted without lock two, the city was exploring, how do we apply this program for the entire city? And I have to note this for Chicago, they do carve out downtown in the lakefront. Um, and, and we hear from people uh, downtown who would like to have access to scooters and we hope the city will move in that direction soon uh, because of the success of lock two. Uh, but having expanded this program uh, citywide, uh, meant that you had to have a more comprehensive parking solution 
Uh, and some cities uh, look at physical parking uh, corrals as Anna just, as Anne just mentioned. Some cities look at uh, virtual parking corrals or designated parking zones. Uh, Chicago said, we want to guarantee that, that these devices are no longer blocking the right of way or, or entry ramps or curb cuts. What's the best way to do it? And they implemented lock two. Uh, what we saw after the implementation was mind boggling. So most cities have a, a complaint system uh, which residents can call or email or use an app to report issues. Uh, Chicago uses 311. I think that's fairly popular. It's either gonna be 311 or 411 in some cities. Uh, Chicago's 311 complaints de declined by 79% uh, between 2019 and 2020. Now remember, this is a program that was operating just in 50 square miles in 2019 and went up to 200 square miles in 2020. So even with the enlargement of the program, complaints decreased significantly because of the introduction of Lock 2. Uh, that meant that the number one complaint that people had for the parking or for the scooter program was parking. And once they implemented Lock 2, uh, they recognized that that was probably the most significant um, solution that the operators could have introduced. Uh, now with this, there are some caveats between the programs for cities who, who offer Lock 2. San Francisco, for instance, only uh, mandates that, that scooters must be locked to bike racks. That severely limits the infrastructure that, you can, that riders can be compliant with. They want to be the most compliant, but if there's not a bike rack near, um, and cities are expanding their bike rack systems, and this is particularly apt for equity zones or lower income neighborhoods, uh, there might not be enough bike racks to be compliant, so the parking problem may, uh, may persist. Chicago went a step further and said you can lock to bike racks and the city has a, a network of 19,000 bike racks that they've installed over the last decade. Uh, you can lock to signposts, you can lock to uh, light posts, you can lock to permanent street furnishings. Uh, and so these were things that enabled riders to be more compliant. They knew the rules, they knew that they had a wide array of options to be compliant. And so they, they followed through with it. That does not mean um, that compliance is 100%, and, and that's not the case for many uh, industries. Uh, but in this case, we did see significant compliance with Lot 2. Um, and this was uh, especially important uh, in regards to equity in Chicago, is, is expanding that access. Uh, there may not be enough bike racks for uh, the areas in Chicago, uh, but they do have signposts and they do have light posts, and that also enabled them to be able to be strong participants in the program. Great. Thanks. Um, I guess shifting to a little bit to kind of equity and inclusivity here, uh, Anna, what you're ba you know you're up in Seattle, you know from your perspective of being in Seattle, what what should a, you know uh, what could a city be doing uh, with micro mobility in the future to create a more fair and just system? Mm. <laughs> I'm going to go really big picture here because I, I think. There is so much potential uh, to create a, a spaces where we can all move around um, without without fear of crashes, without fear of harassment, without fear of police violence. And I think that starts with us thinking much more inclusively about the design of the micro mobility devices that we're we're putting out there. And I think you know while scooters. Um, Stand-up scooters are great for some folks. They may not be good for other folks. And so I'm, I'm excited that we have sit-down scooters here. I think we need to, to you know, think about other, can we, can we create a market um, for other kinds of devices that, that can accommodate different kinds of bodies, different kinds of needs of, of mobility. I think that would be really exciting. I think the other, you know, real barrier is price. Um, even in, even a device can work for you physically, you know, do you have the income if it's a shared device to use it? And so how can we have that um, incorporated into our transit system, into the passes um, up here at the Orca Pass? Uh, you know, how, how can we make it um, completely affordable to, for folks to use um, where, you know, a $2 or $5 ride is just not, not going to be affordable for a lot of folks? Um, I think that's something to really consider. And if we're gonna, you know, also in, in some cases, maybe figuring out ways for folks to own devices themselves rather than shared, if, if that's what they need for their own mobility. And how can we subsidize those the way that we subsidize electric vehicles, uh, car vehicles now? Great, thanks. So Joel, um, you know, from the city perspective, you know, how, how do you, See, I mean, you've you created this public-private partnership, that, you know, with you know Lime on the um, 
bike share, or bike mobility share, I should say. Um, how does the city think about leveraging that in the next couple of years? And then ultimately, uh, you know, what does that look like, hopefully, in five years? Yeah, I mean, I think um, to, to be clear, you know, we're, we're um, permitting three vendors right now. So Lime is one, they're the one that's operating um, bikes and scooters, but we also have Link operating scooters and, and wheels operating the, the sit down scooters. Um, and, you know, the, everything Anna just said, I, I agree with, and I think especially that pricing um, discussions in port, you know, we have really great low income plans here in Seattle so that people that qualify for Orca lift or housing benefits or food benefits um, can get almost free rides on, on our scooters. Um, and then people that work for Amazon, people that are really high income workers can really use scooters on a daily basis. But, but teachers, city, city planners, people like me, like I'll use it every once in a while. But um, I can't plan to use it on a daily basis because of that price. So I think cities are going to need to um, stay very, very nimble um, and really play a little bit of wait and see for the next year as, as the market um, is going to remain really, really volatile. But eventually, we would love a system where we have a couple vendors for resiliency. We have a much deeper partnership approach where we're really looking to maximize rides, maximize low income rides, and then maximize rides at a, at a rate that's affordable for people. Um, and then really looking at, at what type of rides too are these um, recreational rides, which are great. Um, I'm not one of the folks that kind of poo poo recreation. I think that's really important for everybody in the city, but um, um, are there rides that are maybe getting people to transit that, that a city should try and encourage? Um, are there rides that are replacing car trips that the city should really type, try to encourage? And so I think cities are going to need to look at that and eventually probably step up. Um, you know, right now we're, we are fully funded by permit revenue and meeting kind of some of our goals, but not all of them. And I think at some point we need to look at this as a benefit and step up and say, okay, how do we make this um, financially sustainable? How do we make it continue to be um, ecologically sustainable? And then how do we make it just sustainable as it's gonna be here in two years? And right now with our current system, I can't guarantee that, right? We have one year permits. And so um, in terms of something that people can depend on, uh, that people can say, hey, I'm gonna buy um, a house over here, rent an apartment in this neighborhood, and I know I can get around without a car um, because I have these tools. Right now with our, our permitting relationship, we're, we're kind of living on the edge with that. And so I think cities need to come to a, a, a method, whether it's, it's through longer procurement, whether it's, it's longer term deals or something that, that we make this a more sustainable, more affordable option for folks. Great, thanks. Uh, well, I, I, quick follow up, Joel, just, What's the general uh, feeling from people about your uh, piloting, um, closing streets down and, and creating you know, these safe places for biking and walking? Um, I think what I've heard, it's, it's really positive. I'm not working directly in that um, right now, but um, I know there's a lot of people asking us to, to, why are we doing this in a temporary way? Why are we, we saying that, hey, this is just for COVID? I think there's, there, we've seen a lot of success and people are saying, why can't we have this as, as we come out of COVID? And why can't we have this in the future? And, and so um, cool. I think it, it's, it's good to see. And I, I really welcome that push from folks to push the city to, to think about how to make these changes more permanent. Great, great. So Lee, uh, so what's your perspective on uh, what micro mobility looks like in, in um, the future here and how, um, how does it change our cities in the next, you know, five years or so? Yeah, and five years is right around the corner, right? And what we see from the shared scooter companies uh, that started up, right, a lot as one of those companies actually started up as a uh, pedal bike company. Uh, and so the evolution that we saw over the, just the last three years now, and it's going on four years uh, for most of the companies who are around still, uh, is, is that there, there's a lot more um, evolution, a lot more innovation uh, to take place in order to solve these problems that cities are seeing um, and, to be, and to partner with cities 
who want to be leaders in the 21st century with increasing accessible uh, options for people, uh, increasing affordable and safe options for people to get around um, and decrease on mobile usage in their cities. Uh, what I envision uh, is, 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 and before I get there is to take a look at the city of Paris, uh, city of lights. Um, and, and we look at it and it's a city that's actually is smaller in geography than that of Portland. Uh, with 2 million residents within about a 36 square mile geography. Uh, and this is a city with high density um, and it, it has a mayor, uh, Mayor Hidalgo, whom uh, Lyme partners with quite closely, uh, is, is, is adamant about uh, creating a city that can be sustainable, uh, that is less car focused, uh, and that has a myriad of a plethora of options for people to be able to get around. And I think that's a, a really great, a great starting point, right? Is to look at Paris, what are they doing? Because they're really right now sort of the leader within the micro mobility space and it's because of their density. So while it's not easily replicable for America, for, for many cities in America, there are ideas that are being implemented in Paris that can be applied to cities like Portland and Seattle and San Francisco and Chicago um, and even smaller cities, right? Um, and so what I see is, uh, is cities really taking the leadership on this as, as Mayor Hidalgo has done in Paris um, and, and stand up and say enough is enough for car traffic and automobile traffic. These are, uh, it's, you know, there's, there's a conflict that exists uh, between people who are using micromobility devices uh, within the right of way and having a two ton vehicle uh, that is approaching them or on the side of them uh, and they may not be paying close attention. And so I think that the leaders of the, of the next five years are going to be cities uh, that are going to be uh, really taking the step to say, let's reduce the number of parking spaces in our most dense uh, neighborhoods. Uh, let's increase the number of protected, but the mileage of, of protected bike lanes um, in the cities. And with that, as the infrastructure shifts, micromobility companies such as Lime will be right there as a partner with the city to adapt and increase our focus on uh, addressing the number of trips that need to be taken under five miles. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, that's our focus point, that's Lime's focus point, is how can we provide as many options as possible for seated devices, for stand-up scooters, for electric bikes, for mopeds, et cetera, uh, for, for getting people out of their cars and making sure that if they have to travel to the grocery store, if they have to travel to work, um, and they live five miles within that radius, that there is an option for them on the, on the streets. And I think that's what we're gonna see over the next five years is more options become available to people. And we're gonna be looking for cities as the leaders uh, to make sure that the, the city regulations and policies allow for the adoption of more options in addition to bikes and scooters. Thanks, Lee. So, Anne, um... Shifting to your perspective, how can we ensure micromobility helps us meet our broader city and community goals? And I guess where where do we see some of the interesting research in this area? Uh, I think so. I think they're they're linked, and I think it actually ties back to what everyone's been saying so far this morning, which you know, the micromobility has the potential to realize these big, broad goals we have for our cities: getting people out of cars, providing more access to opportunities. Um, but I also think it's worth recognizing that, you know, we've spent the past hundred plus years planning cities around cars, and it's going to take an active and purposeful move away from um, prioritizing car travel um, in our cities. And so that's going to take concerted planning, um, and, and the future will look right if we move away um, from prioritizing cars in many ways. The other thing I think we have to recognize is that for the same or longer, um, you know, our, our cities have also prioritized certain communities and excluded other communities and travelers. And again, I think that's something that will not just disappear with new technologies, right? We have to be really purposeful and thoughtful about how we move forward with these new modes so that we don't replicate um, the, the mistakes and harms of the past, but we, we move forward into a more um, inclusive, inclusive and equitable future that all the other panelists have, have been discussing. And so I think one way to do that, and this is tied into, of course, my bread and butter, which is research, um, but it's thinking about how do we connect the big goals we have to our city, for our cities to actual outcomes. And a lot of that starts with defining the goal and problem. Um, and so sometimes when we look at shared micromobility programs, for example, there aren't any clear goals, at least articulated. Um, we might have these amorphous 
you know, lofty goals, but writing it down even can create action and intention and um, a cohesive uh, vision for all those involved. And then linking that goal to very specific program components. For example, if you're trying to get more people on scooters and make them more accessible to low-income travelers, well, do you have a low-income plan? Is there community engagement to alert people to Joel's point that this program exists? Um, and then are you collecting data and actually measuring that? So basically, great, you have this plan to make these services more accessible. Well, is it working? Right. And then using it all, evaluating it and iterating. And you know, it's easy for me, I know, to say that you know, it's okay if, if it didn't work okay the first time. We can make it better, we can fix it, um, we can figure out how to um, improve the program to make it more broadly accessible. It's hard to fail, but in a lot of ways, um, that failure is the only thing that's going to make us realize how do we need to change it and make it better going forward. Great. Thanks, Anne. So we're going to shift. Um, it's almost 11 o'clock, so we have about 15 minutes here. So I want to make sure that this great panel can answer some of your burning questions on this topic. Uh, and uh, so again, if you have questions, throw them into the Q and A, and we'll try to get them answered. And so the first question that we have um, was from somebody at the city of Springfield. So, uh, and this is kind of near your your home here. Um, and they would love to hear examples and learnings of, from small cities, such as you know, uh, thirty to one hundred thousand population size. What should jurisdictions that are very limited uh, city staff do to collaborate and partner with uh, micro mobility, you know, um, firms or, or companies uh, in these smaller contexts? And so, um, let's let's go with Lee first, um, and then um, if anybody else wants to chime in. Yeah, thank you for that. That is a, a fantastic question. And I, I was, as I thought about what I had said earlier in mentioning, you know, the Paris's and the Austin's or C Seattle's of the world, um, is is also mentioning the Rochester's and Bloomington's and Charleston's of the world. Uh, and so I'll I'll, I'll give uh, Rochester, Minnesota, as a as a fantastic example of where Lyme is. Uh, what we've the best partnership that we've had, or the the best way for us to have the relationship with a city the size of Rochester or even smaller. Uh, is, is one having a city that's very receptive uh, to micromobility as a starting point. And then having a clear line of communication as to what the expectations are for how we can best serve the city. Uh, many cities just want bikes. Uh, in, 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 in this case, you know, as I mentioned earlier, 27% of people, uh, when there are multiple options, only 27% of people tend to go for bikes. Uh, and so that's only one part of the, of the multimodality pie. Um, and so for a city the size of, of Springfield, Oregon, uh, looking at it and saying, you know what, perhaps we have limited resources, perhaps we should uh, keep an eye on an experienced operator uh, who can work with a smaller city who can get everything done without substantial oversight. Um, and they can they can meet the equity goals if as we set them, uh, they can provide the vehicles as we determine the need to be. Um, and they can provide a diversity of, 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 of of uh, mobility options. So going back to my example of Rochester, uh, we currently provide uh, e-bikes and uh, e-scooters for the city. Uh, and this is a city that was really important to work with uh, in the middle of the pandemic because of the Mayo Clinic. And so having a very hyper-local focus on everything that we were doing uh, was very important and keeping a clear line of communication between the operator uh, and the city it was the, the best way forward. Um, and when we start discussing sort of the nitty gritty of the operation, such as parking and everything else like that, there are already examples that we can provide as an experienced operator uh, to be able to work closely with the city. So the city doesn't have to spend time uh, thinking about what are the best ways that we can do this. We can provide examples, right, of the other cities in which we've operated that are similar to a city like Springfield and come up with the solutions that we think are best and, and, and come to the table prepared uh, to answer the questions uh, and, and with solutions uh, that are going to address the problems that you see in your city. Um, so, so my example, so my my recommendation there for mid-sized cities uh, is to pay attention to the experience of the operators on whether or not they have a plethora of different examples that they can bring to the table that can make micro mobility work in your city. 
Great, thanks. And, and Joel, uh, do you have any um, thoughts? Yeah, yeah. I think um, one one really interesting direction I see this could potentially move is is working with the the kind of the larger area, like whether it's a multi municipality or a county or whatever. Um, you know, we city of Seattle borders a lot of other of our suburbs, right? And it, it sometimes get to the point where, you know, you can't, uh, there, there's an artificial line and whether it's 145th in the North or Roxbury in the South or something, you, you can't take a bike or scooter across that line and the rules change. And I think that's not really user-friendly, especially as our more margin marginalized groups um, in cities like Seattle and Portland kind of keep getting pushed out. Um, and so I think it would be really interesting. I don't know if I've seen this done yet for something like a county to set up a program for the suburbs and the small cities within that county that they could just plug into. Um, and that way there could be far more cohesion between these smaller areas, but still kind of the larger resources to really have a proactive management strategy. Um, really respect uh, Lee and my colleagues at Lyme, but I would hesitate to, re to really push smaller cities to, to fully lean on private industry to, for, for the direction and, and how to manage them. I, I, I think um, leverage other resources, leverage NABSA, leverage NACDO, um, or leverage these conferences to try and to, to get best learnings and, and set up your program with your goals in mind. But um, I really am, am curious to explore that, like what role do counties play? What role do like, something like in, in Seattle, the Puget Sound Regional Council, what role do those larger agencies have to set up micromobility really as regional uh, mobility systems rather than something where the rules change every time you might cross a, a, an artificial border. Great, thanks. Um, switching over to another question from, uh, I, I forget who, who said it, but basically it was related to a, um, a topic that I'm very interested in and been doing a lot of work in uh, around inclusive uh, cycling and adaptive cycling. So Anna, um, what is your thoughts around uh, how do we expand the type of options that we provide uh, in cities and how they can be integrated into uh, the fabric. You know, I, I've done some research. We see two different models out there. There is the bike library type of model where you go to a specific place, pick up a uh, adaptive cycle, you use it for a time and you come back. And then there's a couple of places like Milwaukee that are trying to integrate it into their system, having some trikes or, or uh, ride with other um, side by side cycles. So what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's helpful to have something, right? Otherwise, you're violating the ADA, so that's good. Um, I think, though, I would encourage cities to think more about how to make it an integrated approach because when you have the, you know, rental sort of, you have to go to a place, pick it up. It's not really the same. Uh, it's not it's not providing the same transportation um, or filling the same transportation need, right? As as the, the shared scooter or shared bike program. And so, it, you know, it's a much more recreational sort of approach, which is great and awesome and has its place. But if we can get uh, the providers to start thinking about trikes, start thinking about, you know, side by side, start thinking about, you know, tandems or ways for kids to be able to join adults on these bikes. I think there's, there's a lot more demand outside of just the disability community that hasn't been tapped, unfortunately, because I think uh, the folks who are designing this are, are thinking too narrowly, way too narrowly about uh, how we all can get around. And I, I really, you know, I, I think what is exciting about micromobility is that it's this recognition that all of us could benefit from having assistive mobility devices, uh, but they just need to be designed to work for, um, work for all of us. And that's not gonna be the same design for everyone, but if we can start to, to come up with different designs and have those available in our cities, um, I, I think that there would be a lot of people who will use them if, if you can figure out the pricing in a way that really can work, that, that works for folks. Yeah. I think one of the big steps is just even creating your whole system that is electric. Uh, you know, an e-bike is an adaptive cycle in many cases, right? Just, it, it breaks down barriers to just 
able to use a, a, a regular cycle. So um, I, I think that's one step. I know, Lee, I'm not sure if you want to chime in. I know Lime has a new offering, uh, Lime Able, is that correct? That is correct. Yeah, Lime Able is our suite of adaptive devices that we've introduced around the country. Uh, and we, uh, so this program started out in uh, Oakland. Uh, and now we've expanded through uh, to Seattle and uh, Chicago and New York City, uh, where we, we're, we're trying, right? And I think the first step is always interacting and engaging with the disability community um, in the cities in which we operate, because we can't, you know, it doesn't make any sense for us to develop a product and then just place it on the street and it not be the right product for people who need it most. And so working directly with disability rights organizations like Disability Rights Washington uh, gives us the insight that's necessary to produce uh, the trikes and produce uh, hand cycles and everything else in, the, in between uh, that can work for people. Uh, and there, there are some limitations that exist, right, is, is now exploring what's best. Do you uh, have a delivery model? Do you have a regular uh, free floating model? Uh, what we've seen work best uh, from our experience is a delivery model works best because you can have you can set up a partnership with a disability rights organization or uh, say a mayor's office for people with disabilities uh, and then have people request the devices through the Lime app and we deliver those devices uh, to the people who need them for a period of time uh, with a, a very uh, significantly reduced uh, fare uh, for people. In many instances, we use uh, we put them out for free because this is us taking this opportunity to learn how best we can serve every facet of the community that, that we're uh, serving. Okay. Joel, do you have anything uh, you want to say from the city perspective, or we can move to another topic? Don't feel pressure. No, yeah. Um, I mean, I think uh, what, what Anna said and what Lee said are, are, are very, very important. Um, you know, we've partnered with Outdoors for All here, um, a, a huge adaptive recreation um, organization to offer free adaptive cycles in, in the summer, um, but it is that hub-based approach uh, that, that's much more focused on recreation. And then um, we really want to keep pushing the vendors to see how we can kind of make, use that targeted universalism approach of, of let, let's, let's, let's make a device that, that works for people with disabilities um, and, and, you know, depending on, on, on what that specific disability is. And, and then that should work for more people that could work more for, for people with kids or people that want to go shopping with groceries or, or people that just need a little more stability. And I, and I think that's really important. I think um, kind of to what Lee was talking about, we've heard that there's just a lot of um, like one of the major barriers without being free floating is the transfer of if someone does need a mobility device like they're in a wheelchair and it's a free floating system how what do they do with their wheelchair then once they transfer to a to a shared micro mobility device so i know um we're interested in, in anything that might make a wheelchair um, more mobile like an assistive electric device that could be stationed like at transit stations or things like that so um, we're, we're interested in that and, and really pushing our partners to, to start to, to work in those directions. Okay, great. Uh, Anne, I'm going to uh, have you kick off this next question. Um, it's from Anonymous. So uh, uh, can any of you uh, imagine a future that we don't allow cars into the core central city, um, say two to five mile radius? And can micromobility, what can micromobility look like when we don't have to accommodate cars at all? Well, that's definitely a fun, uh, a fun thought experiment. Um, I'd say uh, I can imagine it. I don't know how realistic my imagination uh, is. I certainly think cities have been experimenting, I think during COVID um, with, as Joel mentioned, the, the closed streets and slow streets um, that I think have built some um, potential political will to close down at least select corridors or streets. Um, there's certainly research from psychology that, that says that people have a really hard time imagining things they haven't seen before, which makes sense. Um, it's hard to imagine kind of an alternate reality. Um, but I also think there has to be, there's going to be a lot of um, strong leadership and, and political will. Um, there's a lot of, there's always pushback when space is taken away from cars, be it parking, be it road space, you know, adding bus lanes or um, adding bike lanes, et cetera. And so I don't, I certainly don't think that would change um, 
in the near future, at least. Um, were that to happen, um, you know, I think microbiota could be a great fit for that space. Um, certainly would make the, the travel safer, provide more space for um, people on all sorts of micromobility devices, um, walking, rolling in, in any way that they need to. Um, I think it's probably the, the safest way, um, the safest way to enable any um, power, any human scale uh, travel is really to remove cars from the equation. So I'm not sure it's possible, but it's, it's certainly a fun, I mean, it's possible. I'm not sure the political will is, is currently there. Well, so a follow up on that, I think one of the key things that you need to, uh, if you're going to do that, you need to have really good transit integration. Um, so are you seeing anything in research and, you know, and I'll open up to uh, Lee and Joel and others to uh, talk about the potential for transit integration. Yeah, I'm sure Lee can, and Joel can speak more to that too, but certainly there is examples of micromobility um, integrating with transit. Um, and there's some examples, say Pittsburgh, for example, um, provides free bike share rides to anyone who has taken a, a bus trip. Um, and so providing both first mile, last mile access, but also to your point, John, of, you know, right now, a lot of our cities are auto oriented. And so how do you provide a lot of robust alternatives for people to travel without a car and to allow them to choose the mobility that best suits their personal needs, trip specific needs, um, and to be more flexible. So to provide a resiliency within the system um, and a redundancy to allow people more choice to again meet their, their needs. Yeah, and before Joel and Lee uh, chime in here, uh, Anna has to leave and I wanna thank her for her um, time and, and her thoughts on this topic. And uh, we have uh, five more minutes that I think we're gonna be able to continue the conversation, but I just wanna thank her for uh, her time. Thank you so much. Thank you all, take care. Okay. So Joel Lee, um, what's, how are you trying to think about integrating with, with transit? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a really great question, but a really sometimes difficult question. And it's one I, I think Seattle has a long way to go on to be perfectly frank. Um, I mean, there, there's a number of ways. There's the kind of the physical way that's really important and that, hey, if you come up out of a light rail station and you get off a bus, is there a device there? Do you know what device is going to be there? Is it going to be reliable? And I think um, that's, uh, that's one piece of the equation. Cities should look at really focusing if they're building corrals, building parking infrastructure to put them near transit um, or hopefully kind of at transit. Um, and that's where we, we haven't really been able to deliver in Seattle is, is really building that really tight integration. So if you come off a bus or come out of a station, you can see it. Um, I, I think that's really important. And then there's the fair integration as well. Um, and that's something we, um, we don't quite have the technology yet for in Seattle, but um, being able to say, hey, I, I have that. And in Seattle, it's called the Orca card, the regional transit pass. Um, that could also work on bike share or scooter share. Um, I know a lot of cities have been pushing on that and, and some have been able to deliver, especially with dock-based systems. Um, but I think both of those pieces are, are really important, both kind of system consistency and legibility and then fair integration. Yeah, I'd love to be able to build on, build on everything that Joel just mentioned. Uh, and what we've, the experience that we've uh, seen, uh, and I have uh, three really good examples of, of partnering, of companies' ability to partner uh, with transit agencies. And so for Columbus, Ohio, uh, we've done integrated trip planning uh, where in the, the really the foundation of it, before I get too deep into it, is the technology with which the transit agency has built uh, their fair payment system on. Uh, and this is where the, the complexities of this type of integration occur. But when you have the, you know, the perfect alignment, when the technology works on, on the transit agencies and, and on the providers in, that's where the magic really occurs. And so we, we're, we explore this and we're really doing it and diving deeper. But the three examples I have are for Columbus with uh, integrated trip planning. So being able to uh, open up your, your uh, for Columbus, it's the CODA bus network, your CODA app, and you're able to then see uh, where the scooters are uh, within the city of Columbus. And you're able to sort of map out your route even better. Um, and that's in addition to our Google Maps partnership, where if you open up your Google Maps app, you're able to see line buses and, and or bikes and scooters. Buses is not a part of our offering, by the way. Uh, within the Lime within the Lime app and within the Google Maps app, and now within the uh, transit agencies app. 
Uh, in addition to that, in Sydney, Australia, we have integrated fare payments uh, where we've been working with the, the, the uh, New South Wales government uh, within Australia to integrate their, pair, uh, their, their fare payment. So being able to use uh, your, your, your uh, Sydney uh, Opal card uh, to be able to purchase fares on sh uh, shared scooters for Lime. So that's another example. And the third is uh, within Norway, and this is probably more critical too for a lot of the cities that are on this call, is, uh, is integrated application data uh, uh, sharing. And so being able to share uh, scooter and bus or scooter and bike data uh, with the transit agency. So then they're able to build out their better mapping systems for how bus routes can be integrated or built out. Um, and then where we deploy our scooters and our bikes and any other devices uh, that are necessary uh, for a city to have a full range of options. Uh, so those three fronts, I think, are where we'll see a lot more innovation occurring um, to be able to give people a 360 degree view of how they can, you know, go from uh, the light rail in South Lake Union and, and take a, a bike ride uh, through uh, Queen Anne um, and then use a scooter to hit up a brewery or something like that. And so I think there are a lot of different options there um, that we're looking at. And there are a lot of fronts where we can see a lot more successes happening over the next couple of years. Great, thanks. And, and I know Portland is, uh, TriMet is working on a large uh, federal grant to, to look at um, trip planning integration, maybe not the fair side as much, you know, but at least integrating in their, their trip planning. So um, that's, we're at time. And so I would like to uh, thank everybody on the panel. It's been a pleasure to uh, let me moderate this, this great panel and great discussion and uh, thank uh, Oates for, for the panel itself. So thanks. And thank you, uh, John, also Anne, Joel, Anna, and Lee. We uh, really appreciate you being a part of the conference today. And thank you to our sponsors who are listed on uh, the Sketch conference website. And thank you for all the attendees for attending. Uh, the conference continues. And we want to remind you that we're closing out today at 2 p.m. with in style with Portland's most outrageous drag, Poison Water. So join us for that fun-filled hour of hilarity and hijinks as we play bingo. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you at the next session. And thanks, Selena Lowe, too. And thank you to our ASL interpreters as well. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all so much. <laughs>